Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 30. And, then, and, I, and I want to say this. I thought about this all weekend. A, a pastor asked me a couple months ago, Brother Mike, should we be having church? And I didn't hesitate a second. I said, absolutely. Absolutely. And I said, you know, there are churches out in California and other places where their evil dictator, Nazi, communist governor will not let them have church even though they have a constitutional right to freely assemble. And while Antifa protests all over the country and no one says a word about it, oh, we better shut the churches down. We better not let people go inside the house of God and worship and sing because that can be dangerous. And I'm going to say this. I have felt more guilt over the people in this church that have been infected with COVID. But we were doing what we believed in. We were doing what we believed God gave us the right to do. He gave us the grace to do it. None of us, none of us belong here because of our sins. But Christ has forgiven those and he's sanctified us and he's washed us and made us whole, made us partakers of his heavenly covenant. And God has blessed us with the ability to come and worship before him together as brethren and there are people on the other side of that camera who would give anything to be able to come here and sit in these pews and have church with us brother Wayne sat right over there When I saw that plaque, I went, I want to get that and put that by Wayne's seat. Second Amendment. The other one that I've got in my office, I was going to replace it with it. It said, I'm an angry gun owner clinging to my religion. I was going to put that one over there too. Because that just, when I think of Wayne, I think he's, he's a patriot. He loved his country, loved his president served his country and he loved his church and he served his church by sitting there and watching these doors so that no harm comes in this place and Wayne gave his life for the right of God's people to come and worship him in this place and everybody who got sick, everybody who got infected, everybody who was affected by this virus that passed through our church, we still stand for our right and the grace of God to come and worship in this place. Amen. Wayne died for that. Wayne died for that. And as long as God allows us, we're going to come and we're going to worship God in this place. Now, some people are still recovering. Some people are still a little sick. And it's going to take a while for some people to come back. I get that. I think it'd be wise if people would come and take precautions 
hand sanitize, wear a mask. Okay, I'm not against that. I'm not going to force anybody to do it. But all of us paid a price to be able to come to this place and to worship our God. And I would pay it again. I would pay it again. Bless you, Wayne Shirk. For the stand that you took. And the life that you gave. Second Chronicles chapter 30. There is something that just reached out and grabbed me in this text. <clears throat> We've been preaching on this for a while. And Hezekiah has opened up the doors of the house of God. Think about, think, I mean, think about what I've been preaching and what's happened here. Just ponder that for a, for a little while. You know, we opened up the doors of the house of God and the devil did his best to try to close them again. Did everything he could. And I'll be honest with you, I was, I was afraid to let, let it be known publicly just how many people from our church had been affected by this. Because we have enemies. We have people that don't like us. We have people that hate us. And would love to have us shut down. Call the health department on us and say, hey, that church is reckless. And a bunch of them ended up with COVID and blah, blah, blah. Who knows what could happen? I, I, was, I was a little afraid to let, let it out just how many people had been affected. But then I thought, you know what? We did it. We'll do it again. Now, I don't want COVID again. I don't, Liz, I don't want it again ever. They're, they're saying that even if you have it or had it, you could get it again. I don't know if that's true, but I know I don't want it again. Amen to that. Um, but anyway, Hezekiah opened up the doors of the house of God. We're going to do the same. And then he, verse 1, he said, Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh. One, two, three, four. You get that? Israel, Judah, Ephraim, Manasseh. It's the gospel. The invitation to hear the word of God the, the gospel of God, the salvation of God, the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, God's covenant with man to give them everlasting life. That's what this represents. That they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. So you understand the scene and the setting now. He sent letters out. Letters are like the Bible. And he sent out to four groups. That's the gospel. And the invitation is to come to the house of God. I mean, that's part of Psalm 23, right? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to be here. I can remember the day I laid down with my face to the ground. Begging God to never take me away from this place. I remember the day. And I've prayed it many times since then. Now look at verse 8. 2 Chronicles chapter 30 verse 8. This, this is Hezekiah's letter. And he said, Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you, listen to this, if you turn again unto the Lord, 
Your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. Look at this, though. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, divers of, which means diverse groups, various people, nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Father, help me preach this message. Bless this word. Bless these people. Bless our church. Father, we ask for your favor. We ask for your mercy. We ask for your grace. We ask for your healing, Father. For Brother Sterling and for others, Lord, who are recovering. Father, it's a long, long time being sick. And I pray, dear God, you'd have mercy on each one. And Father, we just ask God, you just bless your word today. And help us, Father, to understand that haters are going to hate, mockers are going to mock, people are going to laugh, they're going to laugh us to scorn, they're going to make fun of us, they're going to try to cause trouble among us, and try to divide us, and try to destroy us. And Father, it's been tried already. And it didn't work. It didn't work. And Father, I pray to your God that you just bless your word today. Help me to preach it. Give me strength. We pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. I mean, here, here, here's Hezekiah. Hezekiah is, is doing nothing to where he's trying. It's not like he's trying to get gain out of everybody that shows up. He's not selling tickets to the gatherings. He's not trying to get money. He's not trying to tax the people. He's not trying to get anything from them. All he's wanting to do is give. All he's wanting to do is give them the opportunity to come to the house of God, to hear the word of God, to bless them. He donated oxen and sheep and goats and everything. He donated all that so they'd have food when they got there. Donated and gave all that. I mean, Hezekiah, he's got, he's got, no, he's got no interest in trying to get any gain from these people. All he's doing is loving his people. Like a good king is supposed to do. Loving his people. Caring about them. Doing for them. Opening up the house of God. Providing them the invitation to come to, ha to have mercy on them. And we invite people to church or we talk to people about Jesus Christ. Or we try to witness to somebody and they laugh us to scorn and they mock us. And they make fun of our God, they make fun of our religion, they make fun of our beliefs. Maybe, maybe they don't do it to our face, but they definitely do it behind our back. You can guarantee it, they do it behind our back. Yeah, them folks over there, they believe this, and that, that's, some, that's like a cult over there. And that, that, there'll be, one of these days we'll walk in over there and see them all with a glass in their hand laying down, drinking poison. Because their cult leader told them to do it. That's what some people say. That's what some people believe. That's what some people think. They mock us. They laugh us to scorn. And all, all I'm wanting to do, all I care about, is for people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, to have the forgiveness of their sins the same way that I got forgiveness of my sins that John, Roy, Melissa got forgiveness of their sins. Everybody listening to me, God forgave you of your sins. He has mercy on you. He cared about you. He loved on you. He did nothing, but he didn't take anything from you, but he gave to you his only begotten son. And they mocked him. And they mock us. Make fun of us. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9. Fools 
Listen to this. Fools mock at sin. Fools mock at sin. I remember my first year in Bible college, I was mocked, laughed at, scorned, because my first year in Bible college, I believed the King James Bible. And I kind of made an issue out of it amongst the student body. And I got laughed at, mocked, derided, made fun of, to my face from people. And the shame of it is, I let that affect me in what I, what I believe. So my first year, I got made fun of. And people talked about me behind my back. My second year, I decided to be Mr. Personality and just go with the flow. And to, I wanted everybody to like me, so I toned it down. And I kind of walked away from what I was saying my first year. And that sort of began the downward spiral of my life until God got a hold of me back in 1997, 98, somewhere around in there. God shook me and God broke me. God worked in my life. And then finally God said, Mike, you know this Bible's right. And instantly I believed it. The Holy Ghost came in. I surrendered to that. But fools, fools mock at sin. They, 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 this, is, this is the gay pride parade stuff. Where they parade around performing godless acts in public. Mocking Christ. Mocking Jesus. Mocking their sin. Displaying it openly, having no shame whatsoever. They're fools because they mock at sin. Mark chapter 15, verse 20. Look at how they treated Jesus. Very quickly. Four, five, five verses here. Mark 15, 20. When they mocked him, they took off the purple from him, put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. They made fun of him. They laughed at him. Mark 15, 31. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. He wasn't there to save himself. Christ didn't come to gain something. He didn't come to take from us. He didn't come to try to save his own life. He came so that he could save ours. Luke twenty two sixty three, 63, and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. They hated him so bad that they hit him. Hated him, mocked him. You ever... Jerry, you ever mocked your sister? Uh-oh. Fixing to start a war here. My sister would do something and I would go, nye, 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 nye. I'd mock her. And then she'd hit me. And that'd be the end of that. Verse um, Luke 23, 11, Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. They, put, they didn't put him in that robe because they thought he was king of kings and lord of lords. They put him in that robe to mock him. You remember what they did? They took a crown, made it, made it out of thorns. And then when they set it on his head, they tapped it down in his head. Gave him a reed for a scepter. Put that purple robe on him with the thorns sticking in his, in his head. Blood running down the side of his head parading him down to Golgotha making fun of him he's the and he took it he let him do it 
And he spoke not a word against them except to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 36, and the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, offering him vinegar. Now, I know some of you Bethel people, you drink that vile stuff, think that's going to cure you. My wife used to drink that, what was it, the vinegar with the mother? Apple cider vinegar with the mother. Wayne's funeral, Al Gross, the guy that really taught me live radio was sitting over there. They had a talk show here in the St. Louis area and him and Tim Barron. By the way, Tim Barron's called me last night. He's going to be, listen to this now, he's going to be passing out tracks in Compton, Los Angeles. And you know what he told me? He said, I figured there's going to be riots after the election. And he said, we're going to go to Compton to pass out tracks before they kill one another. I love that man. He loves sinners. He loves sinners. He said he's got said he's got a t-shirt. Black unborn lives matter. You pray for him. He's at, he called me to ask everybody to pray for him. Pray for Tim Barons. But Tim and Al used to say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna drink our vinegar. And I'd listen to him on the radio and they'd they, you could hear them drink it, and then it'd be dead silence for about a minute. And silence on radio for a minute is a no-no. But I often wonder, why are, they, why are they so quiet? So Tim was going to be gone somewhere. Al called me to fill in, to sit in there with, with him, do the show. And his wife, Jan, brought me some apple cider vinegar. But they mock Jesus with vinegar. You know, what, you know what the deal is about vinegar? It's bitter. And you know what that vinegar represented? He tasted death for every man. Because it was bitter. He complained not. And as a lamb brought before the shearer, he spoke not a word. We get mocked. And our nature is to fight back. Let's look at what the Bible says. In fact, take a look up here. These are ways that they mock Christ. You can go to Amazon and buy products that have upside down crosses on them. Those are used by Satanists as part of their religion. An upside down cross, basically it's just a mockery of the cross of Jesus Christ. And there's a picture of the Pope sitting in a chair, the chair of Peter. And I had no idea why he had an upside down cross on there. But that, I'm telling you, that man is an antichrist. Here's another way. Here's another way that they mock the cross. They put a dead Jesus on there or a dying Jesus or an emaciated Jesus on there. That hospital room I stayed in, the Catholic nuns bought out our local hospital. And as soon as they did, they put a crucifix in every room in that hospital. They were trying to get Brother Sterling to ask him if they wanted a chaplain. And he's going, I'm not Catholic. I don't want no priest in here. Bless you, Sterling. 
There they hold up the wafer, the Eucharist, they call the host, and they say, here's Christ. That's Pope Francis holding what he tells everybody is Christ. We're going to eat Jesus now. We're going to sacrifice him again and we're going to eat him. And that's going to give you salvation temporarily until you sin again. That is a mockery of the cross. Matt, Jesus warned us, Matthew 23, 4, 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ over there, believe it not. Do not believe that. It is a mockery before God to say that Christ is still on the cross, that they can sacrifice Christ all over again and that in the Mass, it is an abomination. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Turn there. We're, this kind of moves forward in the story. Because this is after Hezekiah has had his big revival. And that's the thing. When you have a revival, guess what? You're probably going to have to have another one before too long. You're going to have to have God come in, sweep out the old junk out of your life, renew you, restore you, bless you once again, because everything that Hezekiah did was practically undone by his lineage. So in 2 Chronicles 36, 14, the Bible says, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen. And polluted the house of the Lord, which he, he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending. Betimes means early. Don't wait till it's too late. Go get them. Go try to warn them early. Rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people. Look at this. God loves these people driving up and down the street. God loves all the neighbors that we have around this church. God loves every one of them. And all He wants for them is to offer them eternal life. Forgiveness for their sins. Give them a mansion in heaven for eternity. That's all God wants to do. He loves His people and He has compassion on people. God, don't listen. Don't ever forget. God loves sinners. When they start protesting and burning down buildings in all of our cities, remember, God loves those people. I don't like them. I don't like what they stand for. I don't like what they do. They are anti-Christ. Anti-America. Anti-Constitution. They are anti-Christ in that they mock Jesus Christ in their lifestyle. And in their, in their beliefs. And God has compassion on them. Christ died for them. There is hope that maybe somebody from that crowd. That's why Tim Barons is going to Compton. He's got hope that God will still save somebody out of that mess. Because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Look at verse 16. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words. Years ago, God had to deal with me as a young pastor about how I wanted everybody to like me. So one day I just decided I wasn't going to offend anybody. I was going to preach all nice messages and positive messages and give everybody nice speeches and encouragement and salesman techniques almost. And God dealt with me. God made me sit down and listen to Reg Kelly. Mm -mm. I hated that man. I didn't like him. I thought, you can't say things like that. That's mean. My wife jabbed me in the... Rib cage with her elbow. How come you don't preach like that? He was really upset. 
But God used him to tell me, Mike, you have to love them, but you have to tell them the truth. And don't worry about whether or not they like you or not. They mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their, of their sanctuary and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. At some point, God said, I'm done. I'm writing Ichabod over this place. And I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. Yet I'm going to appoint you to the sword. And God did that because they mocked him. Don't mock God. Don't mock God's people. Turn your Bible to Genesis 21. We have examples. Genesis 21, verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, Ishmael. That's who it was. She saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Because Sarah had given birth to Isaac. And God had already said it in his mind and in his heart that his blessing was going to be upon Isaac, not upon Ishmael. And let me ask you the question, are they still doing that today? Does Ishmael still mock and hate Isaac? You know, I learned something yesterday, John. The... The, the best spy organization in the world is the Jewish Mossad. Do you know where they got the idea of developing a spy agency? Numbers 13. When Moses sent the 12 spies into the land. That's where they got the idea from. I don't know what that means as far as this message is concerned. It's just interesting to me. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. Abraham did what God told him to do. He took Ishmael and Hagar, gave him some water and some bread, and said, Leave. You mocked my son. And I can't have that. And God has sent you out. Now, turn to Galatians 4 because there is an allegory here. A type. A foreshadowing. A story. Not a fable. But a parable. The meaning of that, Galatians 4.22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by the promise. Now, here's what we have. We got a double, we got a double deal going on. First of all, to this day, Ishmael mocks Isaac, the Arabs despise and mock the Jews and have done it for thousands of years. But we also now have another layer of understanding because now, guess who Ishmael is? Guess who he represents? He represents the Jews today who are born of Mount Sinai and that covenant and are in bondage to this day. They're in bondage. And, and he said, verse 29, But as then he that was born after the flesh 
persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. So what he's saying is, the Jew, and Paul knew this. Paul knew this. Paul was beaten multiple times. All, try, they tried to kill him. They imprisoned him. They eventually had his head cut off. Why? Because they were in bondage and Paul was preaching liberty, freedom, being, having the chains of bondage taken off of you so that you are free in Jesus Christ. And they hate that. To this day they hate it. You look through the book of Acts. It was always the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. Every now and then it was the, the worshipers of Diana, Mystery Babylon. But for the most part, it was the Jews who hated the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They absolutely hated it. They mocked it. And I believe that they are secretly behind all of the Seventh-day Adventists, all the Hebrew Roots teachings, all of that nonsense. I believe that. Because of what the Bible says. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And I want to tell you something. I'd rather be laughed at, mocked, derided, made fun of, persecuted, but I'm free. I'd rather have it that way. It's, it's like what I said about church. I take this COVID business serious now. Now I do. When it first started coming out, I just, I had my doubts. But now that I got it, I went, no, nah, that's pretty bad. There's a reason why that crazy gal at Ikea made sure that I put my, I had a Trump mask, but it wasn't covering my nose. And she made sure that I pulled that thing up, Roy, over my nose. I could see her out of the corner of my eye staring at me. Making sure I was going to cover that up. Now, I like my liberty, but I don't like COVID. But I would rather be laughed at, mocked, hated. They're going to hate us. People, they're going to hate us. They already do. You just might as well be a Christian in front of the whole world and not worry about what everybody thinks about it. 2 Kings chapter 2. Look at this. 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 23. This is Elisha. After Elijah's been raptured. He went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way. There came forth little children out of the city. And mocked him. Now I want you to think about this. What is the condition of a society. When their little children have been indoctrinated so much that they mock the preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does that happen now? What, what, what is the condition then of the society that raises children to hate and mock the gospel of Jesus Christ? Little children, it says. Little children that were doing this. And they were saying unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. He turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. That is a picture of the Antichrist in the form of a bear who's going to rule in forty and two months. Because they mock the gospel of Jesus Christ, God will turn them over to the beast. 
They are cursed children. Cursed children. Look at Lot, Genesis 19. All, what, what was Lot trying to do with his sons-in-law? What was he trying to do? Hey, wake up, boys. Wake up. We got to get out of this city. We got two angels here. They're telling us that they're going to destroy the city. We need to leave. Get up. I ain't getting up. I ain't doing that. I don't believe in that stuff. Leave us alone. They mocked. The men said unto Lot, Hast thou there any besides the angels, son-in-law, and thy sons and daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get ye up out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. They said, that old man, that crazy old man, he thinks, he thinks God's going to judge his city. He thinks God's going to come down here. Well, where is he? You know what? That's what exactly what the liberal crowd says today. Where is he? Where is your God? Where is your second coming? Where is your Jesus Christ? How come he's not here yet? You keep saying he's going to come and judge this place. Well, he hadn't done it yet. I don't believe a word you're saying. And they mock. And all we're trying to do is save our country. All we're trying, we're not trying to get anything out of it. Wayne didn't go to Vietnam because he wanted to pay. What was the pay like back then, Roy? $300 a month. Woo! Boy, he's getting filthy rich. He didn't do that to get something out of it. He did it because he loved his country. What he did in his life, when he talked to people about Jesus, when he witnessed to people, when he had Bible studies, when he did all those things for people that, he didn't, that nobody knew about. Because he didn't do it to be seen. He didn't do it to get gain. He just did it because he loved people. And I guarantee you he had people that mocked him. So in 2 Peter chapter 2, God said this, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and then spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them in an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. There's two people in this world, saved and lost. And the lost are always going to persecute the saved. The ones in bondage are always going to hate the ones who are free. They're always going to despise them. They will try to destroy them. They will mock them. They will persecute them. They will kill them if they could, if they could get away with it. And in some cases they do. But God knows how to deliver His people from their persecution. And God knows how to punish those who mock? Somebody say amen. In Acts chapter 2, look at this. Verse 7, they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and the parts of Libya about Cyrene and the strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others, 
mocking, said, these men are full of new wine. You know what? They were. They were full of new wine. But those people, those Jews, were mocking that. They, these men had received the Spirit of God and they were preaching the Word of God in the language that people understood and there were people there mocking that. Just like they do us because we believe this Bible. I tried, after God led me to this, to reach out to my denominational pastors that I knew. Because I thought that they all believed what I believed. And I found out very quickly that they mocked me. The denominational leader in the state of Missouri called Pastor John Uter in to talk to him. And he said, John, you know what your problem is? Your problem is you've been following that Mike Hoggard. That man hated me. That man, is, and at one time, I, I was sucking up to that guy. So, because I wanted a, I wanted people to n recognize me and think of me as some great preacher in the Free Will Baptist. And that guy hated me. Why? Because I believe this Bible. And he did. You asked John. He pulled John in his office. He said, John, let me tell you what your problem is. Your problem is you follow that Mike Hoggard. You need to get away from him. I, the last thing I ever had with them, with the last straw was they, they were having their state meeting. So I called the state office and I said, can I have a booth at the meeting? What for? Well, I want to put my videos and books out there. Well, we don't have room for you. Maybe you can, maybe outside you can set something up outside, but we don't have room inside for that. And that was the last, that was it. I was done, Roy. That was it. I said, I'm not going to chase after these men. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to get their favor. I stand for what I stand, Huh? I stand for what I stand for. I preach what I preach. I believe what I believe. Amen. And I'm not going to change. That's why, I love you. That's why I love you. I'm not going to change just because somebody doesn't like what I say. <clears throat> look, at, look at what Jude said. But beloved, remember ye that the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the what? That means they don't have the Bible. And, and this is, I believe this is talking about preachers. They are sensual men. That means they're full of adultery. And see, all that's coming out now. All that hidden stuff that these guys have been doing for years is coming out in public. And then you find out they don't believe the Bible. They have not the Spirit. So what did Galatians 6, 7 say? Be not deceived. God is not what? God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We preach to people who we know won't listen. Like Ezekiel. Ezekiel was called to go preach. He said, I'm not giving you over to preach to people whose language you don't understand. 
I'm not sending you to some foreign land. I'm sending you to your own people. But I won't, I'm not guarantee you they're going to listen to a word you say. But you're going to preach to them anyway. And God deals with me about that. Sometimes I, I want to kind of say things that I think everybody will agree with. And there's nothing wrong in that. But if I really believe something and I believe it strongly enough and I can back it up with scripture. Then I have a responsibility to say it. Whether people like it or not. And there are some things that I won't say on YouTube or Facebook or anything like that. I won't say it because I don't believe it. And I can't see it in Scripture. And I get criticized for that. Rumors that float around the Internet that people want me to jump on and tell everybody about. I'm not about to do that. I'm not about to chase rumors that are unfounded, untrue. We have not followed cunningly devised fables. We preach the word of God. We preach the truth of God. And we let God take care of the rest. And those that mock will mock God, but God will not be mocked. Let's go to prayer. Again, I want you to pray for Sister Janet. Sister Janet, if you're listening today, we love you very much. We miss our buddy. And the only thing that we can do is to try to be like him try to have his character the way he was he didn't he didn't have any enemies that i knew of he just loved people and cared about them loved the bible man that man loved the bible he turned his life around, turned away from sin. Turned away from the things he was doing in life. And he bore the cross. And he bore the shame. And he died for what he believed in. And that's how I want to die. Father, we come before you today. We thank you, God, for your word. Father, we know, God, that there is always going to be the crowd that despises us, hates us, turns away from us, mocks us, mocks our beliefs mocks our lifestyle. And Father, help us, dear God, to, to just put that behind us. Don't let it eat us up. Help us, dear God, to, to stand and stand against all of the evil that people try to do to us. The evil that they try to do to our families. Destroying our families. Breaking our families apart. The evil people that would want to shut us down. God, in this day, we're finding out. That we have to have you. To help us to stand. Because we can't do it alone. And we can't do it on our own. We don't have the strength. We have too much fear. 
So, Father, help us, dear God, to stand even against those who mock and to love them the way Jesus loved those who crucified him, the way Stephen loved those who stoned him. Help us, dear God, be like that. Because those are people that Jesus died for. Paul realized that. So, Father, I pray, dear God, you just help us with your word today. At some point, God, you'll use this in our lives, and it'll be a blessing. We'll understand why you spoke these words to us. Bless our church, Father. Open the doors back up. Bring people into the house of the Lord. We love you, and we love your house. We thank you, God, for speaking to us today. We love you. Dismiss us now in your care, in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go home.